This is a LibriVox. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Kristen Hughes. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, Chapter Thirteen. Mr. Rochester, it seems, by the surgeon's orders, went to bed early that night. Nor did he rise soon next morning. When he did come down, it was to attend to business. His agent and some of his tenants were arrived and waiting to speak with him. Adèle and I had now to vacate the library. It would be in daily requisition as a reception room for callers. A fire was lit in an apartment upstairs, and there I carried our books and arranged it for the future schoolroom. I discerned in the course of the morning that Thornfield Hall was a changed place. No longer silent as a church, it echoed every hour or two to a knock at the door or a clang of the bell. Steps, too, often traversed the hall, and new voices spoke in different keys below. A rill from the outer world was flowing through it. It had a master. For my part, I liked it better. Adèle was not easy to teach that day. She could not apply. She kept running to the door and looking over the banister to see if she could get a glimpse of Mr. Rochester. Then she coined pretexts to go downstairs in order, as I shrewdly suspected, to visit the library where I knew she was not wanted. Then, when I got a little angry and made her sit still, she continued to talk incessantly of her, a me, Monsieur Edward Fairfax de Rochester, as she dubbed him. I had not before heard his praenomen and to conjecture what presents he had brought her, for it appears that he had intimated the night before that when his luggage came from Milcott, there would be found amongst it a little box in whose contents she had an interest. "'Et c'est le droit signifié,' she said. "'Qu'il y aura le dedans un cadeau pour moi, et peut-être pour vous aussi, mademoiselle. Monsieur a parlé de vous. Il m'a demandé le nom de ma gouvernante. Et si elle n'était pas un petit personne, assez mince et un peu pâle, j'ai dit que oui, car c'est vrai, n'est-ce pas, mademoiselle? I and my pupil dined as usual in Mrs. Fairfax's parlor. The afternoon was wild and snowy, and we passed it in the schoolroom. At dark, I allowed Adèle to put away books and work, and to run downstairs, for from the comparative silence below and from the cessation of appeals to the doorbell, I conjectured that Mr. Rochester was now at liberty. Left alone, I walked to the window, but nothing was to be seen thence. Twilight and snowflakes together thickened the air, and hid the very shrubs on the lawn. I let down the curtain, and went back to the fireside. In the clear embers I was tracing a view, not unlike a picture I remembered to have seen of the castle of Heidelberg on the Rhine, when Mrs. Fairfax came in, breaking up by her entrance the fiery mosaic I had been piecing together, and scattering, too, some heavy unwelcome thoughts that were beginning to throng on my solitude. "'Mr. Rochester would be glad if you and your pupil would take tea with him in the drawing-room this evening,' she said. "'He has been so much engaged all day that he could not ask to see you before.' "'When is his tea-time?' I inquired. "'Oh, at six o'clock. He keeps early hours in the country.' "'You had better change your frock now. "'I will go with you and fasten it. "'Here is a candle.' "'Is it necessary to change my frock?' "'Yes, you had better. "'I always dress for the evening when Mr. Rochester is here.' "'This additional ceremony seemed somewhat stately. "'However, I repaired to my room, "'and with Mrs. Fairfax's aid replaced my black stuff dress "'by one of black silk. "'The best and the only additional one I had, "'except for one of light grey which, in my lowwood notion of the toilette, I thought too fine to be worn, except on first-rate occasions. "'You want a brooch,' said Mrs. Fairfax. I had a single little pearl ornament which Miss Temple gave me as a parting keepsake. I put it on, and then we went downstairs. Unused as I was to strangers, it was rather a trial to appear thus formally summoned in Mr. Rochester's presence. I let Mrs. Fairfax precede me into the dining-room, and kept in her shade as we crossed that apartment, and passing the arch whose curtain was now dropped, entered the elegant recess beyond. Two wax candles stood lighted on the table, and two on the mantelpiece. 
Basking in the light and heat of a superb fire lay Pilot. Adèle knelt near him. Half reclined on a couch appeared Mr. Rochester, his foot supported by the cushion. He was looking at Adèle and the dog. The fire shone full on his face. I knew my traveller, with his broad and jetty eyebrows, his square forehead made square by the horizontal sweep of his black hair. I recognized his decisive nose, more remarkable for character than beauty, his full nostrils denoting, I thought, collar, his grim mouth, chin, and jaw. Yes, all three were very grim, and no mistake. His shape, now divested of cloak, I perceived harmonized in squareness with his physiognomy. I suppose it was a good figure in the athletic sense of the term, broad-chested and thin-flanked, though neither tall nor graceful. Mr. Rochester must have been aware of the entrance of Mrs. Fairfax and myself, but it appeared he was not in the mood to notice us, for he never lifted his head as we approached. "'Here is Miss Eyre, sir,' said Mrs. Fairfax in her quiet way. He bowed, still not taking his eyes from the group of the dog and child. "'Let Miss Eyre be seated,' he said, and there was something in the forced, stiff bow, in the impatient yet formal tone, which seemed further to express, "'What the deuce is it to me whether Miss Eyre be there or not? At this moment I am not disposed to accost her.' I sat down quite disembarrassed. A reception of finished politeness would probably have confused me. I could not have returned or repaid it by answering grace and elegance on my part. But harsh caprice laid me under no obligation. On the contrary, a decent quiescence under the freak of manner gave me the advantage. Besides, the eccentricity of the proceeding was piquant. I felt interested to see how he would go on. He went on as a statue would. That is, he neither spoke nor moved. Mrs. Fairfax seemed to think it necessary that some one should be amiable, and she began to talk. Kindly as usual, and as usual rather trite. She condoled with him on the pressure of business he had had all day, on the annoyance it must have been to him with that painful sprain. Then she commended his patience and perseverance in going through with it. Madam, I should like some tea, was the sole rejoinder she got. She hastened to ring the bell and when the tray came she proceeded to arrange the cups, spoons, etc., with assiduous celerity. I and Adèle went to the table, but the master did not leave his couch. "'Will you hand Mr. Rochester's cup?' said Mrs. Fairfax to me. "'Adèle might perhaps spill it.' I did as requested. As he took the cup from my hand, Adèle, thinking the moment propitious for making a request in my favour, cried out, "'N'est-ce pas, monsieur?' Qu'il y a un cadeau pour Mademoiselle Eyre dans votre petit coffre? Who talks of cadeau? he said gruffly. Did you expect a present, Miss Eyre? Are you fond of presents? And he searched my face with eyes that I saw were dark, irate, and piercing. I hardly know, sir. I have little experience of them. They are generally thought pleasant things. Generally thought? But what do you think? I should be obliged to take time, sir, before I could give you an answer worthy of your acceptance. A present has many faces to it, has it not? And one should consider all before pronouncing an opinion as to its nature. Miss Eyre, you are not so unsophisticated as Adèle. She demands a cadeau clamorously the moment she sees me. You beat about the bush. Because I have less confidence in my deserts than Adèle has. She can prefer the claim of old acquaintance, and the right, too, of custom, for she says you have always been in the habit of giving her playthings. But if I had to make out a case, I should be puzzled, since I am a stranger, and have done nothing to entitle me to an acknowledgment. Oh, don't fall back on over-modesty. I have examined Adèle, and find you have taken great pains with her. She is not bright. She has no talents. Yet in a short time she has made much improvement. Sir, you have now given me my cadeau. I am obliged to you. It is the Mead teacher's most covet, praise of their pupil's progress. Humph, <laughs> said Mr. Rochester, and he took his tea in silence. Come to the fire, 
said the master, when the tray was taken away, and Mrs. Fairfax had settled into a corner with her knitting, while Adèle was leading me by the hand round the room, showing me the beautiful books and ornaments on the consoles and chiffonnières. We obeyed, as in duty bound. Adèle wanted to take a seat on my knee, but she was ordered to amuse herself with Pilate. "'You have been resident in my house three months?' "'Yes, sir. And you came from?' "'From Lowood School in Blankshire.' "'Ah, a charitable concern. How long were you there?' Eight years. Eight years! You must be tenacious of life. I thought half the time in such a place would have done up any constitution. No wonder you have rather the look of another world. I marvelled where you had got that sort of face. When you came on me in Hay Lane last night, I thought unaccountably of fairy tales, and had half a mind to demand whether you had bewitched my horse. I am not sure yet. Who are your parents? I have none. Nor ever had, I suppose. Do you remember them? No. I thought not. And so you were waiting for your people when you sat on that stile. For whom, sir? For the men in green. It was a proper moonlight evening for them. Did I break through one of your rings that you spread that damned ice on the causeway? I shook my head. "'The men in green all forsook England a hundred years ago,' I said, speaking as seriously as he had done. "'And not even in Hay Lane or the fields about it could you find a trace of them. I don't think either summer or harvest or winter moon will ever shine on their revels more.' Mrs. Fairfax had dropped her knitting, and with raised eyebrows seemed wondering at what sort of talk this was. "'Well,' resumed Mr. Rochester, "'if you disown parents, you must have some sort of kinsfolk. Uncles and aunts?' "'No, none that I ever saw.' "'And your home?' "'I have none.' "'Where do your brothers and sisters live?' "'I have no brothers or sisters.' "'Who recommended you to come here?' "'I advertised, and Mrs. Fairfax answered my advertisement.' "'Yes!' said the good lady, who now knew what ground we were upon, and I am daily thankful for the choice Providence led me to make. Miss Eyre has been an invaluable companion to me, and a kind and careful teacher to Adèle. "'Don't trouble yourself to give her character,' returned Mr. Rochester. "'Eulogiums will not bias me. I shall judge for myself. She began by felling my horse.' "'Sir?' said Mrs. Fairfax. "'I have to thank her for this sprain.' The widow looked bewildered. "'Miss Eyre, have you ever lived in a town?' "'No, sir.' "'Have you seen much society?' "'None but the pupils and teachers of Lowood, and now the inmates of Thornfield. "'Have you read much?' "'Only such books as came in my way, and they have not been numerous or very learned.' "'You have lived the life of a nun?' No doubt you are well drilled in religious forms. Brocklehurst, who I understand directs Lowood, is a parson, is he not? Yes, sir. And you girls probably worshipped him, as a convent full of religieuses would worship their director. Oh, no. You are very cool. No? What, a novice not worship her priest? That sounds blasphemous. I disliked Mr. Brocklehurst, and I was not alone in the feeling— he is a harsh man, at once pompous and meddling. He cut off our hair, and for economy's sake, bought us bad needles and thread, with which we could hardly sew. "'That was very false economy,' remarked Mrs. Fairfax, who now again caught the drift of the dialogue. "'And was that the head and front of his offending?' demanded Mr. Rochester. "'He starved us when he had the sole superintendence of the provision department, before the committee was appointed.' and he bored us with long lectures once a week, and with evening readings from books of his own inditing, about sudden deaths and judgments, which made us afraid to go to bed. "'What age were you when you went to Lowood?' "'About ten. "'And you stayed there eight years. "'You are now then eighteen? "'I assented. "'Arithmetic, you see, is useful. "'Without its aid I should hardly have been able to guess your age. 
It is a point difficult to fix where the features and countenance are so much at variance as in your case. And now, what did you learn at Lowood? Can you play? A little. Of course. That is the established answer. Go into the library. I mean, if you please. Excuse my tone of command. I am used to say do this, and it is done. I cannot alter my customary habits for one new inmate. Go, then, into the library. Take a candle with you. Leave the door open, sit down to the piano, and play a tune. I departed, obeying his directions. Enough, he called out in a few minutes. You play a little, I see, like any other English schoolgirl. Perhaps rather better than some, but not well. I closed the piano and returned. Mr. Rochester continued. Adele showed me some sketches this morning, which she said were yours. I don't know whether they were entirely of your doing. Probably a master aided you? No, indeed, I interjected. Ah, that prick's pride. <laughs> well, fetch me your portfolio, if you can vouch for its contents being original. But don't pass your word unless you are certain. I can recognize patchwork. "'Then I will say nothing, and you shall judge for yourself, sir.' "'I brought the portfolio from the library. "'Approach the table,' he said, and I wheeled it to his couch. "'Adele and Mrs. Fairfax drew near to see the pictures. "'No crowding,' said Mr. Rochester. "'Take the drawings from my hand as I finish with them, "'but don't push your faces up to mine.' "'He deliberately scrutinized each sketch and painting. Three he laid aside.' The others, when he had examined them, he swept from him. "'Take them off to the other table, Mrs. Fairfax,' said he. "'And look at them with Adele. You,' glancing at me, "'resume your seat and answer my questions. I perceive those pictures were done by one hand. Was that hand yours?' "'Yes.' "'And when did you find time to do them? They have taken much time and some thought.' I did them in the last two vacations I spent at Lowood, when I had no other occupation. Where did you get your copies? Out of my head. That head I see now on your shoulders? Yes, sir. Has it other furniture of the same kind within? I should think it may have. I should hope better. He spread the pictures before him, and again surveyed them alternately. While he is so occupied, I will tell you, reader, what they are. And first, I must premise that they are nothing wonderful. The subjects had indeed risen vividly on my mind, as I saw them with the spiritual eye. Before I attempted to embody them, they were striking. But my hand would not second my fancy, and in each case it had wrought out but a pale portrait of the thing I had conceived. These pictures were in watercolors. The first represented clouds, low and vivid, rolling over a swollen sea. All the distance was in eclipse. So too was the foreground, or rather, the nearest billows, for there was no land. One gleam of light lifted into relief a half-submerged mast, on which sat a cormorant, dark and large, with wings flecked with foam. Its beak held a gold bracelet set with gems, that I had touched with as brilliant tints as my palate could yield, and as glittering distinctness as my pencil could impart. Sinking below the bird and mast, a drowned corpse glanced through the green water. A fair arm was the only limb clearly visible, whence the bracelet had been washed or torn. The second picture contained for foreground only the dim peak of a hill, with grass and some leaves slanting as if by a breeze. Beyond and above spread an expanse of sky, dark blue as at twilight, rising into the sky was a woman's shape to the bust, portrayed in tints as dusk and soft as I could combine. The dim forehead was crowned with a star. The lineaments below were seen as through the suffusion of vapor. The eyes shone dark and wild, the hair streamed shadowy, like a beamless cloud torn by storm or by electric travail. On the neck lay a pale reflection like moonlight. The same faint luster touched the train of thin clouds from which rose and bowed this vision of the evening star. The third 
showed the pinnacle of an iceberg piercing a polar winter sky. A muster of northern lights reared their dim lances close serried along the horizon. Throwing these into distance rose in the foreground a head, a colossal head inclined toward the iceberg, and resting against it. Two thin hands joined under the forehead and supporting it drew up before the lower features a sable veil, a brow quite bloodless, white as bone, and an eye hollow and fixed, blank of meaning but for the glassiness of despair, alone were visible. Above the temples, amidst wreathed turban folds of black drapery, vague in its character and consistency as cloud, gleamed a ring of white flame, gemmed with sparkles of a more lurid tinge. This pale crescent was the likeness of a kingly crown. What it diademed was the shape which shape had none. "'Were you happy when you painted these pictures?' asked Mr. Rochester presently. "'I was absorbed, sir, yes, and I was happy. To paint them, in short, was to enjoy one of the keenest pleasures I have ever known.' "'That is not saying much. Your pleasures, by your own account, have been few. But I dare say you did exist in a kind of artist's dreamland while you blent and arranged these strange tints. Did you sit at them long each day?' I had nothing else to do, because it was the vacation, and I sat at them from morning till noon, and from noon till night. The length of the midsummer days favoured my inclination to apply. And you felt self-satisfied with the result of your ardent labours. Far from it. I was tormented by the contrast between my idea and my handiwork. In each case I had imagined something which I was quite powerless to realise. Not quite. You have secured the shadow of your thought, but no more, probably. You had not enough of the artist's skill and science to give it full being. Yet the drawings are, for a schoolgirl, peculiar. As to the thoughts, they are elfish. These eyes in the evening star you must have seen in a dream. How could you make them look so clear, and yet not at all brilliant? For the planet above quells their rays. And what meaning is that in their solemn depth? And who taught you to paint wind? There is a high gale in that sky, and on this hilltop. Where did you see Latmos? For that is Latmos. There, put the drawings away. I had scarce tied the strings of the portfolio, when looking at his watch he said abruptly, It is nine o'clock. What are you about, Miss Eyre, to let Adele sit up so long? Take her to bed. Adèle went to kiss him before quitting the room. He endured the caress, but scarcely seemed to relish it more than Pilot would have done, nor so much. "'I wish you all good night now,' said he, making a movement of the hand toward the door, in token that he was tired of our company, and wished to dismiss us. Mrs. Fairfax folded up her knitting, I took my portfolio, we curtsied to him, received a frigid bow in return, and so withdrew. "'You said Mr. Rochester was not strikingly peculiar, Mrs. Fairfax,' I observed when I rejoined her in her room after putting Adèle to bed. "'Well, is he?' "'I think so. He is very changeful and abrupt. "'True. No doubt he may appear so to a stranger. But I am so accustomed to his manner. I never think of it. And then, if he has peculiarities of temper, allowance should be made.' "'Why?' partly because it is his nature, and we can none of us help our nature, and partly because he has painful thoughts, no doubt, to harass him and make his spirits unequal. What about? Family troubles, for one thing. But he has no family. Not now, but he has had, or at least relatives. He lost his elder brother a few years since. His elder brother? Yes, the present Mr. Rochester has not been very long in possession of the property, only about nine years. Nine years is a tolerable time. Was he so very fond of his brother as to still be inconsolable for his loss? Why, no! Perhaps not. I believe there were some misunderstandings between them. Mr. Rowland Rochester was not quite just to Mr. Edward, 
and perhaps he prejudiced his father against him. The old gentleman was fond of money, and anxious to keep the family estate together. He did not like to diminish the property by division, and yet he was anxious that Mr. Edward should have wealth too, to keep up the consequence of the name, and soon after he was of age, some steps were taken that were not quite fair, and made a great deal of mischief. Old Mr. Rochester and Mr. Rowland combined to bring Mr. Edward into what he considered a painful position, for the sake of making his fortune. What the precise nature of that position was I never clearly knew, but his spirit could not brook what he had to suffer in it. He is not very forgiving. He broke with his family, and now for many years he has led an unsettled kind of life. I don't think he has ever been resident at Thornfield for a fortnight together, since the death of his brother without a will left him master of the estate, and indeed no wonder he shuns the old place. Why should he shun it? Perhaps he thinks it gloomy. The answer was evasive. I should have liked something clearer, but Mrs. Fairfax either could not or would not give me more explicit information of the origin and nature of Mr. Rochester's trials. She averred they were a mystery to herself, and that what she knew was chiefly from conjecture. It was evident, indeed, that she wished me to drop the subject, which I did accordingly. End of chapter 13